I didn't have to have a giggle uh, in terms of how many hours um, of we've of time we've spent on business architecture. And here I come in uh, ready to talk to people about what business architecture actually is, and especially what it is today. Um, and you know, following on presentations, especially where I came in from Terry Roach, and also coming in after Krishan's amazing presentation, um, I will be covering uh, quite a bit of ground and, and using a lot of language that um, I'm so proud that Terry and uh, Krishan are using as well, because these are two people who I admire quite considerably in the business architecture domain because they get it, they understand what business architecture is. Um, so what I'm going to cover with you today is just a little bit about the companies that I work for uh, and the brands and a little bit about me and why I'm so passionate about business architecture. I'll then go through some standard stock definitions of what business architecture is and also have a re quick reflection on what is changing in our world of business architecture. I'll then present you with a framework of how to think differently about business architecture if you aren't already doing so. And then share with you some models that uh, I've created or some of my friends have created and um, I'm happy to share them with you today. I'll also talk to you about what are some of those critical skills that business architects need to have today to be successful in what they do. Uh, Krishan covered some of these points already in his excellent presentation, um, and I hope to add just a few more to those points. I'm then going to leave you with a challenge because if we are to be successful in business architecture, it's important for us to shift mindsets. And at the end of the day, we're there to help support our businesses to be successful through business architecture. So a little bit about uh, the uh, companies I work for. So Penrod Consulting is a private boutique consulting company where uh, we connect with practitioners from all across the world um, to do projects. So that's the consulting arm uh, which I lead in terms of being able to do the heavy lifting for a lot of organizations. Coaching Enterprise Architects is a network of very highly experienced enterprise architects that again have come together. Um, and um, I hope they see me as the ringmaster uh, of our incredibly talented service of architects that come in at the right time to help architects grow. And in growing yourself, so I like to think of ourselves as the coaches for enterprise architects, because we come and help you to learn how to fish, rather than only depending on a bunch of consultants coming in to do the heavy lifting for you, it's really important for us to help people learn how to be good, successful enterprise architects. So a little bit about me, uh, as Daryl said, I do live on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. Um, I live on a farm. We have about 200 head of cattle here. Uh, that's not my uh, primary work. That's uh, something uh, that the family runs as business. Uh, but my primary job, and I'm speaking to you from the farm, is to sit here in my corner of the world and hopefully shape people's minds and careers so that they can enjoy the successes that I have had um, as an enterprise architect, but, um, you know, more significantly as a business architect. Um, I have loved uh, this discipline. I've been practicing as an enterprise architect for well over 20 years and have done some very interesting uh, projects in the public and the private sector as well. Uh, one of my joys of being in this position of having many years of experience under my belt is it had, has led me to connect with other architects across the world so that we can all continually work together to grow our discipline of enterprise, as well as the other disciplines of enterprise architecture as well. So let's get stuck into what is business architecture? So I've just pinched, honestly, the, uh, the three areas that speak about business architecture a lot. The first one being the open group. Uh, so the open group tends to describe business architecture as being um, 
holistic views of your business. Uh, they have started introducing the language of capabilities and end-to-end -end value delivery through value streams. Uh, that was in their last update to TOGAF version 9. Um, so we know that it lends very much from the, from the definition of enterprise architecture as well. The next group that does a lot of work and, and many people get certification from the Business Architecture Guild, uh, where they define business architecture as something about strategy. Um, and it's about connecting through to implementation. So I really like the way uh, this definition is laid out because at the end of the day, what we hope to achieve as business architects is to connect strategy with execution so that we're solving the right business problems to enable our businesses to be successful and achieve their strategic business visions. So the third definition comes from the Business Architecture Center of Excellence. So you, if you Google them very quickly, you'll see they, they also have certification. Um, and they define business architecture as being uh, it's kind of a planning. Uh, it's a type of planning. They also use the language of strategy, um, and they talk about business architecture being something very visual. Um, so I hope today to be able to take you through what business architecture has been really for me as a practitioner. Um, Terry and Krishan, uh, you know, have covered um, all the domains that I think are very, very important to us practitioners of business architecture work. Um, so I hope to go through that today. But first, let's look at what's changing in our world of business architecture is making us rethink what the scope of business architecture might be. In the early days when I started working in IT organizations, we didn't even know what enterprise architecture was, let alone business architecture. It was only back in 2004 where I was formally recruited into a role for business architecture. And my role was supposed to help projects deliver the right business outcomes and deliver it well. Today, what's changed is that our perspective has changed from not just looking at things that are happening in IT. And you would have seen all my qualifications are in IT. But business architecture really is more encompassing of the business. That's why we've got the word business in with business architecture. What that really means is that we cannot look at business architecture from a technology lens anymore. And we need to look at it much more broadly. So if we look at what's changing in our world of business architecture, one of the drivers is this whole thing called experience management. And Krishan and his team at Evolve and Amplify lead their business architecture practice with this model in mind because they take a human-centered uh, design thinking approach to implementing change with their clients. So this Gartner research is fairly recent um, and it shows the coming together of all these experience-led initiatives, whether they are customer-led or employee experience-led, a lot of organizations, because they're investing in digital transformations, are now also focused on what we call omni-channel experiences. Um, so there's been the strong push into also defining better user experiences on your omni-channels as well. So we've seen that digital transformations has, has actually accelerated how we practice business architecture with our clients and within the organizations uh, we work in today. So a number of themes also have been pushing us to really stop and rethink how we practice um, business architecture. Um, on the far right-hand side, under digitalization and innovation, you have the concept of digital government. So as in the examples Krishan shared with you today, uh, with the hosting framework in uh, government, there has been such a significant push by the Digital Transformation Agency to make service delivery 
digital, seamless, and interoperable. We've been investing a lot of money in digital as well. However, for a lot of organizations that are building digital infrastructure, building their uh, digital service delivery models, the one thing that we need to remember to mature is our business architecture capability. Because you can have the best technology in the world, but if you haven't helped the business to change and transform the way they work currently, they are not going to be successful in their digital transformation. So we need to make sure that we put business back into digital transformations so that they are now called and, and referred to as digital business transformation. So because of this push, I feel that it is really important for us today to extend the scope of what business architects do in terms of helping businesses to transform and especially to participate in digital transformation. So I'd like to give you now a few things to think about in terms of how do you practice business architecture if you are going to extend your thinking across um, from digital to now thinking about digital business. The old models uh, that we're more familiar with um, I started using the Zachman framework, which is on the left-hand side, way back in uh, 1995, uh, would you believe it? Um, when I was first introduced to the framework, I had absolutely no idea what it was or how to even use it. But I can tell you that this framework is still very important and very relevant today for us as practitioners of enterprise architecture and business architecture. So we can use the Zachman framework, which is really a taxonomy uh, for enterprise architecture or a taxonomy of your enterprise to zero in on what are the concerns of the business and how can we classify them in ways that allows us to create rich models and present them with data and insights to support the business to make decisions about their digital transformation. So where you see the red boxes is where I think we still have a lot of scope for business architecture today. Another model which is on the right hand side comes from the open group. So the open group uh, formally calls out the scope for business architecture in phase A when you're defining your architecture vision, they ask you to go off and look at your organization's strategic plan and to also draw your first high-level model of the business. In phase B, we know it's all about the business architecture. Um, and therefore, you know, creating a variety of business architecture models becomes the main job of the business architect. But what I want you to remember is that in every subsequent phase in the TOGAP ADM, business architecture must be referred to, including requirements management that's here in the middle as well. Um, so again, the scope for business architecture actually cuts across all these various boxes or what we traditionally would call your BIAT enterprise architecture domains, your business information, application and technology architecture domains. And then you bring them all together in phase B through opportunities and solutions. And then you keep including your business architecture specifications as you go from phase F, G, H, and managing your requirements as well. So it doesn't matter which framework you start with. These two frameworks are still relevant to help you identify the scope of your business architecture work and to also use it as a mechanism or a way of managing your business architecture work as well. So one of the other things when you're thinking about business architecture scope is to think about what's my model actually about in terms of what's my business model? What type of business model do I have? So when you've been practicing as a consultant like me, where I've worked across 
the public sector and the private sector. I've actually worked for not-for-profit organizations as well as for very large, complex, for-profit organizations. And one of the first things that I've had to work out is what kind of business is this? What are we in business for? Who are our customers? So also understanding why is the business? Why do we have this business? What's its value to the people that it is here for? So which is why we use language like some organizations, especially the for-profit organizations, have customers. Some organizations' customers are called citizens. Some organizations' customers are called patients or whatever it is. It's important for us to first develop a model of what is this business and why is this business? Because that will help us to scope what our business architecture is. However, there are two ways of now thinking about what is the business. As a business architect, it's really important for us to separate our thinking. And I'd like to propose that there are two ways of making that separation. Prashant talked about the why. Um, that falls into the strategic thinking bucket. So business architects need to think strategically. They need to have the big picture in mind. They need to understand the vision of the organization and what are the means to help achieve that vision. So while we're thinking more strategically, the second way of thinking is to think about how should the business change in order to achieve its strategic objectives, right? And what I mean by that is to really look at how can I change my business model? Where should I change it? When should I change it? and help the business use meaningful methods and techniques to help them affect that change successfully. So when we think about business architecture, remember, you need to actually have two different hats on. Are you a strategic business architect? And is your scope more on the long term? Or are you a business architect that is actually designing the business to transition to achieve its future state. So another way I'd like you to think about business architecture is in these four parts. We've talked about strategy, right? The first part, making sure you understand the North Star of the organization. The second way I'd like you to think about business architecture and what's its scope is in the operating model context. We have a number of different methods and techniques and Terry introduced you to some early today. Um, and so did Raj, value proposition canvases, business model canvases, um, and so on and so forth. The capability model itself is an, an operating model view of your business. It shows how things are connected and how value flows. The next level of model is a logical model context where how do things fit together? Uh, going down to that next level of detail of drawing process models uh, and process flows to show what that operating model logic is based on the business rules that are in effect within the business. And the fourth level is a much more higher level of detail. That's the physical, that's the actual nuts and bolts operations of the business. So you've gone down here to such a low level where you're actually defining tasks. You're automating tasks, or some of these tasks might still be manual. You have people process information and technology all working together. This is the execution of the operating model. And when you deliver that executable operating model, you are hopefully well aligned to delivering your organization's strategic ambitions as well. This is another way I'd like you to think about uh, business architecture as well. So the previous way looked at it in layers, where we go from a very high level of detail down to a very low level of detail in the organization and in the business. This is a completely different view, and this is aligned more towards a human-centered design thinking way of the business. 
So if we understand the strategic context and why we're doing business, it's really important to understand what and how should we deliver this business. So one way of being able to unpack that what and how is to use your business architecture in combination with process architecture, which by the way, process architecture is in scope for business architecture as well. So we start off by taking inside out views of our business. So we identify all our customer touch points on the left-hand side. We understand how does our customer feel or think or what do they say or what do they do when they come to us for the delivery of a service or a product. When they're interacting with our business, we basically document that interaction and we call it the line of interaction. This line of interaction and this furious to and fro from the inside to the uh, from the out, outside to the in of the business happens on what we call the front stage. So quite often we can draw models now to show us what that interaction is on our front stage. But in order to deliver great experiences to our customers and redesign these lines of interaction using human-centered design approaches, we need to also understand the line of visibility. We need to understand the experiences that our services offer to our customers in terms of how do we orchestrate the service delivery to our customers. So over here, using concepts like value streams uh, become really important and critical. Service models, service blueprints become really important for us to be able to understand what that line of visibility is. The backstage then allows us to identify what are our internal capabilities in terms of people, process, information, and technology, and how shall we compose them arrange them, assemble them, and mix them so that we are delivering the best experience to our customer every time. So that tends to be a backstage view. The customer has no idea of what that arrangement looks like, only we do inside. But in order to deliver these capabilities across people, process, information, and tool, we hit the next line of interaction which is our line of internal interaction. So quite often, this is where process architectures come into play because we can use the process architectures to also help us identify not just the process, but your data and information. Who are the people? Who are the systems? Who are the actors who are required for these interactions? And what is the technology platform that is enabling these interactions to, to occur? So what we're doing is assembling our organization's resources to now deliver the capability outcomes. So again, we're very familiar with models uh, in this space, process models, uh, service interaction models, um, our class models, our data models. But at the end of the day, everything needs to be supported by the foundations of our business. What do we need to support? And this is the last line of support, which allows us to fine tune all of our resources and assemble them in a way that then delivers the capability outcomes of the climate. So I call this the change context because in order to deliver the strategic context, it is critical that we understand what the change context, context is right across these lines of interaction. So that when we bring them all together and we model them as business architects, we understand how each of these layers interact and are assembled together to deliver our strategic outcomes. So this is pretty much what we want to try and do as practicing business architects. We help our enterprise architects and we help our business people to define what the strategic change is. We participate in portfolio prioritizing uh, initiatives and activities. We help to scope and define programs of work 
based on the impact of change on capability. We then come across and work with our process architects to now help design how the change should be affected across people, process, information, and technology. And we change and embed it within the new capabilities and the capability improvements that are being delivered. So at the end of the day, we have a well-tuned, well-oiled operations model that is delivering wows to our customers. So I call this space the change delivery space where we have strategy aligned with execution and we embed the change in the business to make sure that all those improvements that we're now offering stick within the organization. The other role that business architects need to remember that they have is in governance. So as part of the enterprise architecture governance team, making sure that you are supporting change to be delivered effectively is a critical role for you to have. I love this framework. It actually originated uh, from Gartner. Um, and I love it because it brings together all the concepts and the practices that architects need to get involved in, not just business architects. But I'd like to challenge you to identify how can you participate in an approach like this that allows you to take a problem, to look at it and understand it through using very rapid uh, methods to build prototypes and bring the business in to assess these prototypes in terms of desirability, viability, and feasibility, and select the right projects to go then go and either create new products or services or improve the ones that you have, and then also make sure through a series of adoption activities to embed the change within your organization. I can tell you, having practiced this, uh, using this framework to practice business architecture myself, I have been involved in each one of these activities that you see on the screen today. I like to call it the customer first approach. It brings together design thinking, human centered design thinking. It brings together investment planning, lean, agile, value management, all into one framework where you can now operate as a business architect in with a multidisciplinary team to make our products and services stronger and deliver that wow much better. So right now I'm going to take you through uh, some of the models that I've worked with uh, over time. Um, I've done some work in for Evolve and Amplify, so you'll see some of their models in this uh, pack as well because they are really good examples uh, to share with you. Um, and I hope it leaves you with an appreciation of, we don't just uh, talk about it, we actually do it as well when we're practicing uh, in terms of business architecture. So in terms of strategic thinking, you've heard uh, many people um, through the day talk about concepts and models like the business motivation model. Uh, the business model canvas and the value proposition canvas. I think collectively these three models can be used quite successfully, whether you use one or whether you use them all. They complement each other to help you as a business architect to facilitate the strategic conversation across the business. The business mo motivation model comes from the object management group. It's a very simple, easy to use specification to help you to understand and appreciate your organization's strategic motivation. It gives you structure. There's a really rich meta model underneath that specification, which helps you think about the strategic context. It helps you think about drivers and levers and what's putting pressure on the organization to change. What is the course of action can you invest in or suggest your business invests in in order to achieve its desired results as well? So on all the projects I do, because they're involved in changing business models, I always start with this model 
to help understand what the North Star of this particular client's company is. So you've seen Terry showed you some examples of the business model canvas and value proposition canvas as well. Again, these are complementary models. They're not meant to be mutually exclusive. So when you start practicing using your strategic thinking context, you will find it very simple to use these models with your business uh, key stakeholders, any other stakeholders for that matter, um, to show them what might be possible if they made different choices uh, to redesign their business model in a different way to deliver innovation at the end of the day. So these are a couple of examples that I created for a not-for-profit organization. So again, people quite often are um, afraid of using these models in the public sector or for not-for-profit. Uh, but I can tell you as a practitioner, they were equally useful to use to model the value propositions of not-for-profits as well. So on the top left-hand side is the business model canvas for a uh, food and agribusiness um, network. A group of people here on the Sunshine Coast that come together and work as a community to um, market their products and to grow their businesses um, in a way where they leverage the network strength to be successful. So on the bottom right-hand side is their value proposition canvas. And we built it in stages by working with their customers and stakeholders, understanding their personas and persona profiles, and using that as an input to help use these two models to have discussions with their board in terms of what their target operating model should look like. So those were models used to help you think about strategy. Here are some examples of models you can use to help facilitate change within the organization. So again, examples of these models have been shared with you earlier today. So I'm going to show you some of my models. Uh, we're going to look at some service delivery models, service blueprints, persona profiles, as well as how I've used capability models to help drive and support the change agenda in organizations as well. I've got an example here of an engagement model that I created for the enterprise architecture team. Um, so I hope you find these models uh, and examples useful. So as a business architect, um, we need to extend ourselves beyond just capability modeling, beyond just business motivation modeling. As Krishan's presentation, uh, in Krishan's presentation, you would have heard him talk about his company taking a human-centered design approach. And that is really critical because in our day of delivering and transforming our services to be more digital, we need to be using things like psychographic analytics profiling our personas, getting closer to them, truly getting into the mind of these of our customers so that when we design for the future, they are these designs are aligned to what the data is telling us uh, needs to happen. So over here, you've got um, examples of work that we did through Evolve and Amplify, where we used data and conducted interviews with people you and me out there, Joe Blow, uh, to try and understand what are the personas that we need to engage with and then profiling them in a more detailed way so that when it came to now creating uh, and documenting the customer journeys, we understood these journeys better. We understood the emotions. We could empathize with these customers when we redesigned and offered them a new architecture and a new operating model. Experience design models like your product roadmaps and your service blueprints are again very critical models for you to learn how to draw as a business architect because it's important to connect experiences. Remember, we're connecting the front stage with the back stage. So if we know what product and service delivery um, 
we want to offer, we can then better align what happens on our backstage through the actual product design and service design and the support of our systems and solutions to deliver better experiences. So the service blueprint that you can see on the bottom right-hand side is actually quite complex and detailed. This is not something that I would present just like this to a customer. I'd actually walk them through this model to tell the rich story of how we're working to connect our front stage with our backstage. Next, using capability models. Uh, so this is a client I did some work for uh, in Southeast Asia, where we offered them a capability model and showed them how to use the capability model to forecast their maturity over time so that they could see, appreciate, and understand uh, what they needed to do and what they needed to invest in in order to deliver their digital transformation. So again, getting involved in using these tools becomes a critical part of your architecture story as a business architect. This is another way we have used the capability um, models to now become the support of investment planners. As a business architect, I can now use the capability model to now highlight and place overlay. So what I'm doing here is connecting data with insights. I'm connecting where should the organization invest in order to uplift the capability maturity across people, process, information, and technology as well. So now not only am I helping the business to make better investment decisions, on the bottom right, I'm connecting those investment decisions with moments that matter. So I'm bringing together and integrating investments and directly correlating them with, if you invest in this way, these are the moments that matter on the customer side that you will be contributing to. If we don't invest in these capability improvements, our customers are not going to have great experiences. And if we have a failure in any of these moments that matter, we are at risk of losing our customers. This is an example of a business engagement model for enterprise architecture services. So again, a very simple model that you as a business architect should be able to whip up in a couple of hours. Maybe it will take you a day. But having very simple models that shows how you connect customer with the service that you offer is really important for you to be able to have conversations with what do you do? What value do you offer? And why should you as a business or a customer come to me to receive a service? So having models on a page that can comprehensively articulate how the business finds you and receives value from you is really important. So you can apply the skill set on behalf of the business as well and show them what their customer engagement model looks like as well. You can do similar things for employee engagement models. So if we're redesigning our employee capabilities, our HR, finance, IT, whatever that is, Use these te same techniques as you would with the business to design uh, customer experiences to now design employee experiences as well. Use the models in workshops to take people along on journeys with you so that they buy into the change that you then propose. Journey mapping doesn't belong to the customer side alone. It also belongs to employee interactions and employee experiences are as if not more important than customer experiences. Simply put, if customers aren't having great experiences using your digital tools or your tools of your business, they are not going to be offering the best experiences to your customers. So making sure that people have the right tools to do their work 
allows you as a business architect to support your own backline. So I've shown you a lot of models that you as, an, as a business architect should be doing um, and the ways in which you can practice using those models in the business today. So I'm coming towards the end of the presentation and what I wanted to cover with you now is what skills do you need to practice business architecture today? I think you've seen through the presentation and have a good comprehension of the technical skills that business architects need. Modeling is one of the top ones. Um, but I'm going to go through what the left-hand side of this uh, slide says, because I think they are actually more critical for business architects to have today. The soft skills, and you heard um, Daryl talking about Bart Papagai and what he thinks is important for um, architects to have in terms of skills. Bard also emphasizes soft skills and maturing our soft skills is critical for us to practice any type of enterprise architecture. So hence, very critical for us in business architecture as well. Listening. This is one of the first things, one of the first lessons I learned the hard way. My customers are not here for me to teach them about business architecture. My customers are not here to do, my customers are here to listen, to have me listen to them in terms of what are their problems? What are their challenges? What is it that they're trying to do? And by listening to then build empathy for what those challenges are, to have an appreciation for them. Yesterday, I ran a strategy workshop with a client and towards the end, the client actually said, Christine, one of the things that you have to appreciate when we are defining the vision uh, for our digital services is that our customers only reach out to them during their worst moments in their lives. And therefore, that immediately drew on my empathy skill that when I'm trying to define a vision statement for digital services, I have to make sure I use my own empathy to build empathy into that statement as well, because it's going to direct the rest of the organization to be empathetic as well. Leadership being another soft skill that, again, a lot of organizations invest time in growing leaders in their organizations, but the leaders, these trained leaders, very rarely get to practice or are supervised to practice what leadership actually means. So leadership means walking that talk, doing what you say everybody else should be doing. So if your own business architecture practice is not working well, you can't expect to be then going out and advising other people in the business how to set up their own business models and optimal, optimally deliver products and services. So start by leading and showing people through leadership on how to be successful at business architecture. Business architects need to learn how to connect things. And that's what I mean by networking. We need to be able to connect the right people and the problems with the right solution. And the only way we can do that is by building a significant network, whether it's within your organization or it's outside your organization. You need that network because it allows you to accelerate how quickly you can connect solutions with problems and deliver well. To be inquisitive is another critical skill because when you're inquisitive, is when you get to innovate. If you are constantly in the mode of challenging the status quo, it allows you to broaden your ability to practice business architecture and add a lot of value to solving the problem that you're looking at right now. I always say business architects and enterprise architects and all architects need to be brave 
And that comes with challenging respectfully. Not doing things the same way because that's the way it's always been done. Business architects need to lead the change in the business. And therefore, to be brave and immerse yourself in the business to show people in a safe way how they can change effectively and how can they embed this new change within their business areas. A skill I've had to draw on quite often as a business architect is negotiating. I've always felt that business architecture tends to become the meat in the sandwich, where the business wants things to happen really quick. And IT on the other side, perhaps is not delivering it or understands what the business wants to deliver. So I've always found I've had to negotiate between these two groups in organizations and with vendors and with risk managers and with security, especially cybersecurity, to negotiate a solution that would work well for everyone. And quite often I find that as a business architect, I end up being more like the UN in the company, being objective in the assessments in terms of what the business wants and being objective in assessing what's the best solution to offer up to solve the problem. I'm not going to drain the slide in terms of technical skills because I think through the presentation, you've got a fairly good understanding of what business architects need to have in order to be successful as a practitioner. And we've only got 10 minutes left. So the last section of my presentation, I want to leave you with thinking about what can you do to help shift mindsets? What can you do to help people think more about business architecture? And what support you need as a business architect to support your business as well? So I love these, this particular slide, uh, which I used to teach quite often on the Applied Business Architecture course with EA Learning. This slide shows you where our practice in terms of architecture is moving. I still see a lot of clients practicing architecture in phase A and phase B, where what we're delivering is what I like to call useful architecture. We're helping people to reduce costs. We're reducing complexity in the organization by rationalizing our technology portfolios. We're doing little bits of improvement projects in terms of improving systems and how they work. And because we're doing that, we're kind of improving business processes as well. Over the last 10 years, I've seen more of a shift into the trusted space where people are now working more on business capability modeling and using capability planning as a tool to build trust with the business and therefore to improve business performance. We're seeing still not enough practice in phase D and E. We are seeing some companies really embrace human-centered design and human-centered ways of delivering great experiences to customers and citizens and so on and so forth but not enough because a lot of people who are going down that digital transformation path are actually only doing useful architecture. They are not doing what I call partnership architecture. And what I mean by partnership architecture is where we have not just our business architects, but our enterprise architects as well, embedded in the business and working together with them at the same table on the same level to improve the way experience are delivered, to improve the way the business operates, and to make decisions together as a group rather than working like a service provider. So therefore, we can be part of that change. We can bring that change together by now participating in multidisciplinary teams using a framework like this where we can bring the right solution delivery teams and the people with the right knowledge of what the problem is that we're trying to solve so that we can work together to solve problems and innovate. 
we can now participate not just in governance, but in the actual delivery of change, right from strategy through to when change is embedded in the organization. We can participate in each one of these other capability areas across portfolio program, project, and change management as well. We can be part of the change as business architects to now deliver the wow. We can help the business to look at different ways of how to increase desirability, how to assess viability, and how to ensure that we have the right skills and resources to feasibly implement the outcomes that our business is after. And on that note, Daryl, I'm done with six minutes to spare. Fantastic, uh, Christine. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to click on this button here and just pop up this comment from Strategic Architects. And uh, yeah, just a comment there about um, informative and contemporary and, and very valuable. So um, uh, yeah, thank you for that for that comment. And I agree wholeheartedly. So as I said at the top of the session, um, just uh, spend an hour with Christine. You'll walk away with new ideas, new perspectives, uh, and you'll be an arch a better architect as, as a result of it. So. Appreciate you your time in, in, in sharing all of that with us, uh, Christine. Look, I have a bunch of questions. Uh, sure. We only have five minutes left, so um, it's going to be difficult. Uh, I might just pick a couple. Uh, and um, I know that we're going to be talking as part of a panel in an event uh, a couple of weeks from now, so maybe maybe I'll keep some of those questions and, uh, and ask you some difficult ones uh, on the day. Um, but, uh, yeah, do appreciate uh, you you're spending some time with us. And uh, let me just tweak that a little bit. There you go. And uh, so let me let me ask you a couple of questions. So I'll make an observation, I guess, uh, when you were talking about empathy, that um, back uh, a few years ago, I was working for one of the major banks uh, here in Australia, and um, uh, I uh, I used to sort of jokingly say that uh, we offered architecture and counselling services uh, because there was always that human element of the people that we were dealing with, and they were always challenged by a lot of complexity. Um, and uh, being able to sort of help them uh, with the change that was going on in their world as well as uh, them helping us to sort of architect the change that the business was asking for. So, yeah, I take the point on that. Um, I did want to ask a little bit about language. Um, so, uh, and and it, it reminds me of a situation I had a couple of years ago where uh, there was a, a desire to adopt an industry reference model uh, but a reluctance to do so from the business because they didn't recognise the terms that are in it. And I was just wondering what your experience was in, in determining an effective vocabulary to use with, with a business when you're trying to help them understand. Um, it's a good question, Daryl. And, uh, you know, there are two dreaded words in Togat, which I actually really love. It's called the enterprise continuum, right? It's a really good framework because I think people don't understand how to use industry reference models. An industry reference model can never just be taken off a website or picked up from a network drive and used immediately in the business. If you do that, that's when the business will never want to use it because, as you said, the language is unfamiliar. What's important for us as architects is to convert the industry reference model. It's only meant to be used as a reference. You need to convert it into the language that your business uses. And where they immediately recognize themselves in the model. If they don't recognize themselves in the model, they will never use it. The other key thing is when you're developing a reference model, and I had to do one for a, 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 a stockbroking company uh, I've been supporting, there is no industry reference model to use. So what the heck do you, where do you start from? So I think in both these cases, it's really critical to take your business on the journey with you when you're developing the model so that they can understand and appreciate the struggles and challenges with building your model. 
and they can offer their insights and their perspectives on how things should be assembled and organized and laid out. And when they do that, they buy in and they're willing to use it. So in this particular stockbroking company, they have now reached the CEO of the organization by just doing a simple investment overlay on the capability model. Where are we spending all our money, right? And that's an amazing success story because we went from nothing 